My name is Nicola Aylwood and I'm Head of Learning for Young People here at Learning and Work Institute. Uh, we're delighted to have everybody with us this afternoon um, and to be able to, to launch a series of new resources um, alongside providing insight into one of the fantastic programmes that we've been able to explore um, through this project. So before we get started, just a couple of short housekeeping points to share with you. Um, so firstly, if you would please ensure that your cameras are switched off and your microphones are muted, that would be greatly appreciated. Also, we have a Q&A session towards the end of the webinar, at which point I will invite people to ask questions. Um, in addition, you're very welcome to post questions and comments into the chat, bo chat box as we go through. Um, finally, we are recording today's session and we'll be making it available on our website along with the slides after the webinar. Um, so it's really great to have so many people with us this afternoon um, from different parts of the world. Um, could I please ask that people type their names, their organisation and which country they're from into the chat box, please? That would be great. Um, so this webinar is part of a wider project that Learning and Work Institute is delivering, which is focused around identifying and promoting effective practice in pre-apprenticeship programmes in different parts of the world. I'll provide some background to the work in just a moment, but before, before I do so, I'll just hand over to Louisa de Simone from JP Morgan, who have kindly supported us with this work. Thanks a lot, uh, Nicola and Sean as well for the invite and for organizing the webinar and good afternoon or good morning to everybody. I'm very pleased to be here today on behalf of JP Morgan. So here we are, it's 2021, a new year. Uh, We're still, many of us still working from, from home, adjusting to the pandemic, uh, perhaps a bit better equipped compared to last year to the new ways of working, new ways of learning and new ways of living. Based on, what, on lesson learned, what we know is that um, usually in the aftermath of global crisis, young people tend to be more disadvantaged in terms of a higher unemployment rate, higher inactivity, especially if we look at the most vulnerable amongst youth. So despite the health emergency still evolving at different paces in different countries, the collective efforts to build a better future post-COVID have already started. So for instance, uh, at the European level, the European Commission has launched several initiatives as part of the Pact for Skills, the Skills Agenda, the Youth Employment Support Package, all uh, building on different strands of work to really help bridge the, to jobs um, young people. So um, they have different tools, such as the youth guarantee, uh, the modernization of vocational education and training, and of course, the renewed emphasis on apprenticeships to leverage the opportunities uh, linked to the digital and green transitions. In this context, I believe that the project coordinated by the Learning and Work Institute with the support of JP Morgan uh, is even more relevant and offer very relevant uh, tools um, in terms of good, good practice, uh, evidence and peer learning opportunities that uh, I hope will be useful to all of us uh, practitioners that are actually delivering pre-apprenticeship program or similar uh, bridge schemes, uh, funders, employers um, and any stakeholders that is supporting young people progression towards apprenticeship pathways. As you might know, promoting economic inclusion and access to opportunities for young people is at the very core of JP Morgan corporate philanthropy commitment uh, across 37 countries globally. And as part of this mission, under the umbrella of uh, our global initiative, Skill, New Skills at Work, in 2019, um, we committed to invest $350 million globally over five years uh, to develop, test and scale innovative efforts to prepare individuals with the skills they need to be successful in, in, in the changing economy. In light of the pandemic, uh, I believe even more strongly that by working together with a range of different stakeholders across countries, like today with the Learning and Work Institute, Fundasau Yoshpi, and the other training providers, nonprofit organization, uh, business alliance, uh, we can really contribute to make apprenticeship programs more inclusive. We see strengthening pre-apprenticeship schemes to prepare young people to access formal apprenticeship programs as, as a way to achieve this goal. It is our hope that the case studies and toolkits presented today will provide actionable guidelines and good practice needed by practitioners to design more inclusive and effective bridge programs, particularly for the most vulnerable uh, segments among youth. 
Thanks once again to the learning of work for the collaboration and for giving all of us this opportunity to come together virtually. That's great. Thank you, Louisa. And as I said, we're really grateful to JP Morgan for the support that they've provided. Um, so in just a moment, you'll be hearing from my colleague Shauna, who will introduce you to the new resources that we're launching today. We'll then be hearing from Claudio and Max from the fantastic Formari pre-apprenticeship programme in Brazil. Before I hand over to Sean, I just wanted to set the work in context a little. Um, so LNW has been working with JP Morgan since 2018 to research and share best practice in the design and delivery of inclusive and high quality pre-apprenticeships. During the first stage of the work, we looked at programmes in different parts of Europe. Um, we produced six case studies, a provider guide and facilitated um, a range of knowledge exchange activities. Um, the context within which we're all living and working now has obviously changed a great deal since 2018. However, even before the pandemic, we knew that far too many young people struggled to make sustained and positive transitions into the labour market. Um, many had poor experiences of school and were unable to complete basic ed education. Um, others struggled to gain work experience and to find secure employment. Um, sadly, data from across the world shows that young people have been hit particularly hard by the global economic crisis that's been caused by the pandemic. Um, soaring levels of youth unemployment alongside disrupted education is really creating a generation of young people whose transitions into the labour market are quite significantly affected. Um, and whilst the pandemic is undoubtedly affecting the majority of young people in some way, um, the most disadvantaged young people are being disproportionately affected um, and effectively pushed further away from apprenticeships and from wider labour market opportunities. And I think this really reinforces the importance of effective, high quality and inclusive pre-apprenticeships um, that really provide opportunities for the most disadvantaged young people. Um, the work that we've undertaken to date has really shown that providers in different countries um, deliver pre-apprenticeships in very different and very creative ways. Um, we very much hope that the, the resources we're sharing with you today and the wider activities that we're undertaking through this project will make a difference in levelling up opportunities for all young people to access apprenticeships. Um, a little later in this session, I'll be talking about our forthcoming programme of peer learning activity. Um, but before I do that, um, I'll hand over to my colleague, Shauna, who's going to introduce you to the resources that I mentioned. Thank you, Nicola. Um, good afternoon. And thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, it's great to see so many of you here. Um, my name is Shauna and I work as a researcher here at Learning and Work. Um, so I'm going to start by providing you with an overview of LNW's bank of resources for pre-apprenticeship providers. Um, so we have developed um, a set of resources to support pre-apprenticeship providers with the design and delivery of high quality programmes that support young people to enter apprenticeships. So all of our resources are open access and available on our website. And this includes a full guide to the design and delivery of pre-apprenticeship programmes, a guide to delivering blended learning, a guide for skills development for young people on pre-apprenticeships, 11 case studies of good practice, a series of case study videos, and a report which brings together findings from research undertaken throughout the course of the project. So the first resource I'm going to talk about is the provider guide to the design and delivery of pre-apprenticeship programmes. So this resource um, is divided into a number of sections um, to support with the design of pre-apprenticeship programmes, employer engagement, uh, developing strong partnerships on pre-apprenticeship programmes, recruitment and initial assessment of young people from disadvantaged backgrounds, um, good practice in delivering your pre-apprenticeship programme, as well as advice and guidance on evaluating your programme. It also contains a self-assessment tool, which is um, there to help you to identify the strengths and weaknesses of your programme. And this week we have published two brand new resources. Um, so the first resource is a guide um, to blended learning on young, for young people on pre-apprenticeships. 
So many of you will have had to adapt to delivering programmes for young people online over the past year, um, which has been a new experience for the majority of learning providers. So this resource has been developed to support you and other organisations to adapt to a blended learning approach and it contains advice and guidance to support providers to learn from wider research and practice in delivering blended learning. So it contains practical advice and guidance on um, how to design a blended learning program, choosing online tools and methods for blended learning. And it also cont contains tailored advice about delivering particular aspects of your program, such as delivering literacy and numeracy online, delivering work placements in a blended way, um, and employer engagement, for example. Uh, the resource also, also contains key factors to consider and guidance about digital inclusion for young people, as well as top tips for keeping young people engaged online. So the second resource we have published um, is the provider resource to skills development on pre-apprenticeship programmes. So we know that labour markets across the world um, are constantly changing um, and young people continue to need a wide range of skills in order to build sustainable and rewarding careers. So this resource has been developed um, for organisations who wish to improve their programme to ensure that young people are equipped with the key skills they need for an apprenticeship and their future career. Uh, the resource is divided into a number of sections um, including um, advice and guidance on delivering transversal um, and transversal and learn to learn skills, which are sometimes referred to as soft or transferable skills. It also contains advice and guidance about delivering basic skills of numeracy and literacy, as well as digital skills and employability skills. Each of these sections contains um, case studies um, of effective practice um, in delivering um, these skills areas, as well as key factors to consider when making decisions about this aspect of your programme. Uh, so the resources that we have developed and published this week are accompanied by a set of um, detailed case studies. Um, and these case studies illustrate the ways in which organisations deliver unique or innovative practice for groups of young people who are disadvantaged in the labour market. So the case studies offer really practical examples and guidance on how each organisation has designed their programme to meet the needs of the young people that they support. So for example, um, outreach and recruitment of young people from disadvantaged backgrounds, uh, different models of design and delivery, uh, partnership working to meet different needs of young people, as well as progression routes and outcomes for young people on each of the programmes. So we have worked closely um, with six organisations this year who are delivering um, pre-apprenticeship programmes for young people and others who are disadvantaged in the labour market. Uh, so we've conducted virtual case study visits which, with, with each of these organisations which included a document review um, and in most cases, qualitative interviews with key stakeholders such as delivery staff, employers and young people. So these case studies really showcase how programmes are designed and delivered to meet the needs of young people with diverse backgrounds and experiences. Um, so this table provides some examples um, from the case studies that we undertook this year. Uh, so Invest2 in Ireland, um, targets young people from low income households to enter apprenticeships in the IT sector. Um, for Mari in Brazil, um, which you will hear about very shortly, um, targets um, young people from low income households. Bright Light, which is delivered in London um, by Catch22, supports young people who are leaving the care system to enter apprenticeships and the integration pre-apprenticeship in Switzerland um, was a national program which supports refugees and asylum seekers to enter apprenticeships. Um, and finally, the second technology opportunity school delivered by La Rieca in Madrid targets young people who are not in education, employment or training, um, as well as care leavers and refugees. 
So a huge thank you to each of these organisations um, for their really valuable contributions to your knowledge and understanding of pre-apprenticeship programmes. So just to finish off, um, all of our resources um, are open access and are free to download. Um, they are on our pre-apprenticeships resource page on the Learning and Work website. So please do try the resources out um, and share these with organisations and your networks who could really benefit from those. Um, and just to confirm that we will share the resources with you also by email um, after the webinar. Um, so we'll stop there and hand back to Nicola. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shauna, that was great. Um, so as, as Shauna said, we really hope that the resources will be a valuable practical tool for you. Uh, so please do visit our website, download them, share them, um, and also please give us feedback on them. Um, and I think just to pick up on, on one of the key points um, is that for, for many young people, transitions into the labour market can be insecure and disjointed. It's not unusual for young people to regularly move in and out of um, unstable, low paid, low skilled employment, often in, interspersed with periods of claiming welfare support and also working in the informal labour market. Um, and this is really where effective pre-apprenticeship programmes can make a huge impact. Um, so we know that high quality and targeted programmes um, that really support young people to develop some of the core skills that Shauna has just spoken about um, can be crucial in enabling young people to break the cycles of unemployment and precarious employment um, and to be able to establish sustainable careers. Um, so I'm now really pleased um, to welcome Claudio, who runs the Formare programme in Brazil. Claudio is joined by Max, who is a graduate of Formare and is, and is now um, living and working in the UK. So I'll hand over to you, Claudio, if that's OK. Yes. <clears throat> Thanks, Nicola. Thanks uh, to everyone from the Learning and Work Institute and also uh, thanks for everyone from JP Morgan for allowing us, us to be here showcasing this very interesting program that we have been developing in Brazil since 1989. So um, to start off, I would like to tell you that the Oshby Foundation was founded in 1989. And at that time, the president of the company, uh, the company is called the Oshby Maxion, is one of the largest uh, producers of auto parts in the world, including wheels and some other parts. Uh, they, they really wanted to give back to the society some of the things that they have already received from society. So they decided to put up this uh, foundation and launch two projects related to education. The first project was called Art at School, and this is the one that you can see in the red dots around the Brasilia map here, uh, where we train around 8,000 teachers, art teachers, from public schools all over Brazil every year. And the other one is called uh, Formari and is related to initial professional education. We've got uh, around 67, 68 units in Brazil and two units in Mexico. And this is the theme of our, of our presentation here today. So this is a picture of a current group of former students from Formati in their graduation party here in Brazil a couple of years ago. And for you to understand, when we started this program in 89, we wanted to do something different. We wanted to create the state-of-the-art program for low-income students uh, so that they could leave schools and have, and have some type of program that would allow them to enter the job market. So, Formati started from the beginning to look for this very particular segment of society, which is uh, people with social vulnerability. And by social vulnerability, we understand there are young people studying in public schools in Brazil from 16 to 18, sometimes 19 years old, uh, coming from families which average monthly per capita income is up to one minimum wage. So we're talking to about people that are basically in the bottom of the social pyramid in Brazil. And we really wanted to take care of them and show them and give them a good opportunity to change their lives and to transform the way they will see themselves in the future. 
But we also wanted to do this in a different way, in a very innovative way. So what we did at the time was uh, we started researching which one was the best program in the world to deliver uh, training and vocational training for students. And we, we saw that there was a very important paradigm at the time, which is still the, the, the biggest paradigm at this moment, which is the dual system, the German dual, dual system, where students have the technical side being delivered at school and the more pragmatic side uh, being delivered within a company. And we wanted to do things completely different in a very innovative way. So what we did, what our uh, pedagogical team created at that time was the formary program. And we actually broke some of these important paradigms. The first paradigm was related to where the classes are delivered. If, we're, if you want to train people so that they can get jobs, there's no better place than within a company itself to give 100% of the training because it's impossible for us to transfer from a company to a school some things like a strike or um, you know peak of production, um, you know lack of 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 sales and so forth. So situations that are very common to the day to day life of a company, they cannot be simply transferred to uh, to a school uh, into a, a classroom. So we really wanted to do this and. Since then, 100% of our program is being delivered within companies. So this is the first paradigm, be it the, the theor theoretical part of it or the more pragmatical part of it. The second paradigm that we changed was uh, who are the best professors for these students? If we want to teach them skills that are important for their employability, there, there's no better professor than people who are already um, working in the job market. So 100% of our professors are uh, employees of the companies that have contracts with us. So what we do is we invite them to join the program. We train them. We give them pedagogical tools. We give them uh, booklets for students and books for uh, professors and educators. We train them in our methodology. And they are the ones who are actually teaching the kids to do this, this the, to, to develop these skills and competences. So we work in partnerships with companies and our professors are actually what we call educator volunteers, okay, for all of our subjects. And the third paradigm that we changed was uh, related to employability. So uh, if we want to teach them how to get a job, it's important that we, we keep in mind the percentage of the employability rates that we have every year. And we are a little bit obsessed with this, with this number. And we currently have around 83% of employability rate after the end of the program. Uh, another paradigm that we changed was the curriculum. If we want to employ these kids, what we had to do was to bring the curriculum closer to the companies. So what we do in the beginning is we make a diagnosis of the company and, and we look for the skills they need to develop, the skills they don't find in the job market, the skills they don't have inside the companies, and the skills they want to have in the future. So our pedagogical team will look into this diagnosis of the company, we'll put together a curriculum that's 100% customized for each of our partners, and then we will train the workforce of the company, the ones that are interested in working with us in this project, so that they can become um, educators, educator volunteers. Uh, with this project in mind, we then believe that we have an excellent learning environment, which is the company itself that works as a learning environment. The most up-to-date educators in the market who are the employees of the company, the ones that are interested in joining us in this project, we offer face-to-face -face online or blended classes to these, to these uh, youth. Uh, with that, we reach a high employability index, which is, as I said, around 83% at the end of the course. We promote social inclusion and also business volunteer uh, for all of the partner companies. Some of our numbers, we have uh, 30, 
32 years of activity. Uh, we are working with 44 partner companies. We've got 67 teaching units. We have international presence with two units based in Mexico in the cities of Chihuahua and San Luis Potosí. Uh, we are currently present in 50 municipalities all around Brazil. We have already developed over 140 different courses because we work with any type of company, be it industry, commerce or services, it doesn't matter. We've got already over 22,000 uh, students. In 2020, we had over 1,000 students. In 2020 itself, we trained over 4,000 uh, employees from companies. And with that, we reached over 80% of employment rate after the course. These are some of the companies that are partners with us. As you can see, for instance, we have Cummings, uh, which is a very important company from the auto parts industry. But we also work with logistics, for instance, with DHL and some other companies. We work with uh, the aerospace industry with Amber Air, which is one of the most important um, uh, airplanes uh, producers in the world. We also work with Susanna, Susanna which is uh, one of the most important producers of, of, of paper and cellulose. GE, for instance, in terms of an energy, L'Oreal uh, beauty and hygiene projects, and so forth. Our program uh, has three different bases, and we work with three, three of them at the same time. The first basis is related to de the development of life and work skills, which are skills that a student needs uh, for their personal life and also for their professional lives. And these are skills that are common to any program that we implement in the market. The second one are the set of skills related to the specific needs of the company. And even when we work with companies that compete between themselves, we have different skills to train the students. Uh, and then we have uh, what we call the integrated project and the professional pro uh, practice. By the end of the course, uh, the student needs to present to the board of directors of the company solutions for real uh, problems that they feel in their day-to-day -day lives that the company chooses every year, a set of five to 10 different problems. They present these problems to the students at the beginning of the course. And by the end of the course, in the end of the year, the students need to present the solutions to the board of directors. And they're they are going to be analyzed and assessed, evaluated by the solution that they can uh, come up with. And so these solutions need to be uh, implemented and it needs to be feasible to be implemented if the company wants to implement in the end, of the, if they want to hire the students to implement the solutions. Okay, this is an example of a course. So uh, in this generic base, we have oral and reading communication, applied mathematics, business organization, and so forth. Then an integrated base, as I said, creativity and innovation as part of the uh, integrated project, life and work project, and the technological base, which are the subjects related to each different sector and each different company that our pedagogical team put together. This is an example of the certificate that the students live with. We have a partnership with the Federal Technical Federal University of Brazil. So any Brazilian student uh, from Formati lives with this certificate, which is valid nationwide. And in the case of Mexico, we work with two technical universities as partners. We work with the Technical University of Chihuahua and the Technical University of San Luis Potosí so that students can have their degrees validated later on if they need from the universities. Uh, so we believe we have reached the state of the art in terms of face-to-face -face training for students, but with the upcoming of the pandemics, we are now working with uh, at distance learning, online learning. So we are currently putting together a new project that we called eFormati, where we are developing a new learning management system that could uh, take care of students uh, at distance. And we are now developing a mentoring app to develop life and work projects because every student from Formati, they need to leave the course with what we call a personal and work project. 
so that they see themselves in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years, and they have a project to follow if they want to, uh, if they want in, in, in the future. So we are putting this together in a mentoring app that uh, people in, in disability, in, in vulnerability, will need to, will have the opportunity to access from wherever they are all over Brazil and Mexico. And we want to launch this by the end of 2021 with the support of JP Morgan. So thanks to JP Morgan. Uh, this project, this app will also uh, count with 100% online or hybrid courses. We're gonna be offering up to 1,200 hours for every student. We are including skills for Industry 4.0. And we are also working with what we call nano degrees. So the students will be able to choose the skills they wanna study. And in the end of the course, they're gonna have what we call a 3D curriculum composed by each one of the skills that they have studied. And each skill will be uh, developed by a maximum of 10, a 10 hour course. So that's why we call it uh, nano degrees. So we are looking for partners uh, in two different ways. We're looking for partners to help us fund this project, uh, which we believe will cost around 500,000 pounds, around $700,000 to put this together. But we're also looking for partners that can support us with technology. So if there's anyone interested in working together with us to offer for free to any low-income youth in the world this opportunity to have their skills developed, please get in touch with us because this is a great opportunity and we want to launch it by the end of 2021. And now we want to, it's great to hear from me because, you know, I uh, work for the company about, you know, all the beauties in terms of the training that we do for students and how this is being developed and put together. But I really wanted to show you with uh, a practical example. So we have invited Max Conceição. Max is one of our alumnus from the group of 2004, and he was recently promoted to global strategic strategy buyer from Jaguar Land Rover. He's based in Gaydon in the UK, and I would like to invite Max to join us. Hello, Max. everybody. Afternoon. Can you hear me? Hi, Max. Yes, we can hear you. So, so welcome. Again. Welcome to this to this forum. So, Max, I would like you to ask uh, to to answer three different questions. One is what? How was your life before you joined Formari here in São Paulo? Uh, how was your life during the course? So, how was the experience of you know being part of the Formari family? And how was your life after you leave Formari? So if you can please talk to us a little bit of our experience, I would appreciate it. Great, great. I'll, I'll try to answer your, your question in a, in a timeline. Uh, so first of all, thanks, Claudio, for, for inviting me to be here to share a little bit about my journey. And thanks, Learn and Work Institute for this great webinar. And I think we will we'll, we'll get more life that need help in the world. So. Uh, First of all, uh, I would say that uh, you can imagine that a life for a low income in a developing country is not easy. So answering your first question, how was my life before Formari? I would say to you that I was l just living day by day and try to, to guarantee that in the end of the day, I'll have food on my, on my table and uh, trying to split a little bit of my time between work and study. And I started to work very, very early, even before Formari. And uh, yeah, life was very difficult to me. And it's as is to a lot of people in the world that is coming from the, from the, from the low position, low level in the in pyramid. And they have uh, mainly, when you want to talk about developing country that some situation is still very critical. And uh, just to, to, to exemplify what I'm saying here, the one example that I will always, always comment is, uh, I live about uh, 50 miles from the, 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 the Volkswagen site where I did the, the, the test, the exam to, to be part of the Formari. And I didn't have money to pay the bus or, the, or, or tax uh, or anything. I have to cycle into there. And, uh, and I have to, to lend a cycle for my, for, for my, for my friend. 
So it was, was a really uh, difficult situation and mainly because you, you, you don't know what you're capable for. You don't believe in yourself. You don't have dreams. You just, uh, as I say, live day by day. And then uh, I have one, one of my friends in, in, in this school comment, okay, I'm going to do an exam for a, for a, for a, a course in, in, in Volkswagen. And I get very inter interested. And yeah, I applied for the Formari and I was one of the, the, the select uh, 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 to be part of the program. And I, I would say that in terms of professional and personal life, that was one of the most important things that happened to me for sure. And then that was the first door that opened to me to maybe here now and get where I, where I am now. That is not a lot, but it's it's much more than uh, my initial dream, to be honest. And uh, during the formari, it's I I I, I, also, I always say to my friends that it's ten years in one that live there, because when we start in formari, it's a complete shock of culture to us. It's a shock of culture to all these young people that enjoy a, a, a factory. Uh, 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 a factual situation, a factual environment. And you started to be in, in, in touch with manager directors because uh, as Claudio said, everybody is very uh, engaged with the program where the program is implemented to. And then we we start to have in touch with people that start to be an example in life to me. And uh, the program, it's as Claudio said, it, it's drive you to be employed in the end but much more than, than the employed and the technical skills is the, is the soft behaviors and soft skills that you learn for me was the more important because in my, I have the opportunity to start to, to build my dreams and to, to create a, a, a clear way what I need to do and understand and learning what I need to do to get there. And uh, this was not possible without I have uh, people to advise me uh, and when we say we have a volunteer there uh, in, in the class, our professor, it's, it's much more than professor. It, it's much more than volunteer. It's friends that is there that uh, teach us and care with us. And I start to, to be, to have a lot of friends there and a lot of example in life to me. And this was definitely what, what changed my life because I started to first believe in myself and uh, 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 I start to understand what I capable for. And then through Formari, so in the end of the course, I was employed by Maxon. And uh, that was my first real income that I have in life. And uh, this was very pleasure to me. And through Formari and through Maxon, I have the opportunity to start my engineering. Uh, and I have a lot of support from Maxon and from Formari during my university. And then after I start my, my engineering world, and when I start to work in engineering after Formari, I was to work with uh, uh, people that g teach me informality. So uh, people that believe me and know my personality, know who I am. Uh, and uh, also after formality, I have the opportunity to become a, a, a volunteer there as well and give a class of pneumatic for, for a couple of years there uh, after, uh, before I leave uh, Volkswagen. And uh, until, then, until now, I have a lot of close friends that, uh, uh, I always weekly or daily have in touch. We, we, when I go to Brazil, I always in touch with them and was uh, one of the more important part of my life because they come to be an example in life to me and give me was my, the fuel to me to drive my, 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 my way and to have my dreams and, and, and fight for it. And uh, uh, yeah, so my English, uh, I never, never thought I was capable to, to, to speak another language. English is not my native uh, language. And uh, my first uh, uh, understanding with English was in Formari. And after Formari, because I don't have money, uh, the, the teacher that uh, minister English uh, in, in Formari uh, gave me class for free on Saturday. And, uh, and I, I start to grow up better my, my, my English level. And this open a lot of door to me. And now I'm here working to Jaguar Land Rover. And as Claudio said, the, uh, recently uh, during pandemic, I was promoted. So the company believe in me. And uh, yeah, so my, my future completely changed since Formari uh, get in my life. And I, I'm very proud and that I, I was part of that. And uh, it, it's really pleasure to me to be here talking about my history and everything that happened to me.
Thank you, Max um, and Claudia. That was fantastic. Um, a really interesting presentation. Um, and I think it, you know, just really demonstrates how your programme um, can empower and enable some of the most disadvantaged young people um, to overcome the challenges they face, um, even in what is a very precarious um, and insecure labour market. Um, and Max's insight was so powerful in terms of uh, I guess really showcasing um, the impact that a programme like Famari can have. And I think for me, Max, um, when you spoke about the staff and volunteers who really cared for you um, and gave you that sense of belief in yourself and to be able to plan for the future, it sounds as though that was a real turning point for you um, yeah. in terms of your journey. Absolutely, absolutely. More than, more than of course, the first in employment there was very important to, to start my way. But more than that, the more than skill technical was was uh, uh, the how they care with me and how they support me to believe in myself and to go 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 for it, and 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 that was definitely the the, the more, more rich part of the program. Absolutely, thank you so much. Um, we have a couple of questions, um, Claudio, if that's okay. Uh, so the first one from Karima, how did you get the companies interested in your programmes as you ask quite a lot of them? So how do you get them involved and engaged? Okay, uh, I will need to tell a little bit of the story of Formati. Uh, when we started, we were supposed to be a social programme only for Yoshi Pimaxion 32 years ago. And then all of the companies that work together with the Oshpim Maxim to produce the auto parts started to see the difference and started to see the program happening within the company and started to ask for the Oshpim Maxim to implement the same program in these companies. So that's how we became a foundation. That's how we separated from the company itself and became a separate part, a separate entity, including the fact that we work with uh, industries that are competitors to Yoshpi Maxim. So we are completely independent and we basically depend on word of mouth. So it's one company talking to the other, sometimes one uh, volunteer educator coming from one company and change the company goes to another, goes to work in another company and wants to bring Formati to that company. And we count uh, on a lot of people that are interested in making a difference in the world uh, some of the HR leaders are really, really worried about this. Uh, we have here with us, for instance, one example, which is Soraya. Soraya is here with us. She represents Cumming, Cummings, uh, and she's a great supporter. So thank you, Soraya, for being with us. So it's talking to people and counting on the word of mouth to implement this. And I see that uh, you also ask about the investment. The investment that we ask companies are not so big. So just for you to understand, for instance, for us to create a curriculum for the company, to train the, the employees of the company and to implement the project, the company pays us around $10,000 just once and it doesn't need to pay anything else uh, for the program itself, plus a monthly uh, payment of $1,000 for a group of around up to 30 different students. So it's not a lot of money that we're asking for these companies and they're really interested in making a difference. That's great, thank you, Claudio. Um, and a similar question from Veronica, who's particularly interested um, how you get the employees to volunteer. And I think the volunteers are a really crucial aspect of your program, aren't they? So could you tell us a bit, little bit more about that, please? Absolutely. This is the first question. Whenever we go to talk to a different, a new company, they, they tell us, well, I'm not going to have the, the, the minimum amount of volunteers necessary to run the program. Mm -hmm. They're all worried about this. And we always get surprised by the number of people that really want to be part of it. Uh, what we do is uh, we set up a lecture within the company and we explain the program. We, we ask uh, people from the new company to visit a formary program running in another factory or another facility. And when we do this lecture, we always have much more, uh, many more individuals interested in participating in the program than we initially uh, thought that we could have. And sometimes we need to ask people to take turns. So in one year is this group of volunteers, another year is another group of volunteers. Sometimes in some companies we have around 
uh, 150 or 200 volunteers and we need only a minimum of 50, 60 volunteers. So really, people really want to make a, a change in, in other people's lives. And if they have the opportunity to do this during the work hours is even better. And that's what we provide them with. That's great. Thank you, Claudio. And Max, and just, I, sorry, Nicola, just, just to add a little bit about this answer from Claudio. And uh, people, when see program like for my, they go with open heart and they deliver much more than only the technical skills. And, and, and it's really incredible to see how people in company engage with the program. Great, thank you, Max. And I was going to ask you actually about your experience of volunteering, as I think you mentioned that, that you went back into the program in that role. Yeah, for me it was, was fantastic, I would say. And because it's the, a, 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 an opportunity to me to start to give it back to Formari what Formari gave to me. And the, the experience to see there, young people with a lot of hope in your eyes looking to you and pay attention and listen what you're saying, like you are a hero, it's fantastic. There is no, there is no word to describe how, how pleasure it is to you be there sharing and learning all the time because you, you're not teaching only, you learn as well in the same way. Uh, and it's, it's really fantastic. It's a really pleasure to, 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 to be part. And, and Nicola, if I can add just one little thing to what Max was saying, we've been uh, looking into the, the latest research on uh, the skills that the millennials and the Generation Z uh, people uh, are looking for in terms of what types of companies they want to work with. And one of the things that we've been noticing is that this new generation, more and more, they're looking in, uh, into uh, companies that work for a purpose. Mm -hmm. So they really want to be, so Formati also works as a, as a, a tool to maintain the employees because sometimes they receive offers to change the companies and they don't want to do this because in the new company, they don't have a social project running inside the company during the work hours. So it's also a tool to attract talent and to retain talent within the companies. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So from the employer's point of view, it's really um, something that they can offer to their staff in terms of their, their personal and social development. And I'm sure, Max, um, as a volunteer, you were a fantastic role model to those young people having gone through the programme yourself um, and showing them what a success they could make of themselves. Um, so there's lots of thank yous in the chat for you both. Um, and uh, lots you. of congratulations to you, Max, on your recent promotion. Um, a final you. question, Max. Um, what are your plans for the future? What do you intend to do next? Yeah, so... One, one of the things that I, I, I built inside of me in a positive way since for my was the ambition. And I always push hard myself to, to, to be in a learning curve, to improve what, personal and, and professional as well. And yes, I'm always looking for, for something more in my life, uh, even, even in a, to a professional return or to a social return, but just trying to be better and better for my family for my colleagues and for my society. So yeah, I think uh, I'm looking forward for my future yet. Yeah, so continuing to learn and grow. Yes, yes, exactly. That's great. Thank you, Max. And we wish you the very best of luck with that. Uh, so huge thank Thanks, you to Nicole. Claudio and Max. We really appreciate your contribution. Thank you. Um, and as we mentioned earlier, Formari is one of six case studies that we've developed um, through this project. Um, it's now available on our website alongside the other five that Shauna mentioned earlier. Um, also, later this year, we will be making a short film with the team at Formari about their programme. So also please look out for that um, as we go along. OK, so um, I'm now going to talk about the um, peer learning activity that we're, we're launching as part of this project. Um, so the peer learning activity very much builds upon the ethos of this project, which is about sharing best practice and working collaboratively to develop pre-apprenticeship programmes that will really benefit young people. Um, so the peer learning activity will be facilitated by Learning and Work Institute. Um, it's really an opportunity for providers from different parts of the world to come together to share their experiences, their knowledge and their different ways of working. Um, participants will be encouraged to reflect upon their own programmes, um, particularly in terms of what works well, what some of the challenges have been and how they have overcome them. Um, so the application process for the peer learning activity is now open. 
Um, it's open to providers who are currently delivering pre-apprenticeships, uh, but also to providers who may not be delivering pre-apprenticeships right now, but are keen to set up and develop new programmes. Um, so the application form can be found on our website and a link will be sent to you after this session. Um, it's a short form and we really want you to use it to briefly tell us about your programme um, and what you'd like to get out of taking part in the peer learning activity. Um, and ideally, we're looking for a mix of providers, so um, perhaps some experienced providers who are de delivering well-established programmes um, using tried and tested methods, uh, but also newer providers or providers who um, perhaps want to work with a different group of young people or to take a different approach to delivering their programmes. Um, so the deadline for applications is the 5th of March. Um, after that point, the LNW team will be reviewing the applications and we'll get in touch um, to let you know if you've been successful. Um, providers will then be matched into small working groups um, and there are likely to be around three or four providers in each group. Um, each group will work with um, a member of LNW staff who will guide their activities and support the peer learning activity. Um, so in terms of timings, the activities uh, will start in May with an online meeting of all participants. Um, providers will develop an action plan for their programme. Um, they'll then meet regularly within their groups. Um, and I guess it's important to say that providers will be matched um, and activities will be planned around what the participants hope to get out of the activities. Um, so it will be very much a tailored approach uh, that responds to the challenges um, and the aims of each provider who takes part. Um, so all providers who take part will be offered £500 in recognition of their time and commitment to the programme. Um, they'll also get the opportunity to take place in our wider knowledge exchange activities, um, one of which we hope we'll, we'll be able to deliver face to face um, towards the end of the project. Um, alongside a webinar programme that we have planned for later this year. Um, but I guess the main benefit of taking part is really the opportunity to build new relationships with other pre-apprenticeship providers, um, to gain insight into different ways of delivering programmes, um, to learn new approaches and ideas, and ultimately to explore creative ways of supporting young people through pre-apprenticeships. Um, so as I said, the application um, process is now open. It's available on our website. Um, the closing date for applications is the 5th of March. Um, if, you, if you would like to have a conversation about the opportunity before submitting an application, then please get in touch with the project team um, and you can see the um, email address on your screens now. Um, equally, I'm very happy to take questions now if anybody has any in particular. OK, um, are there any final questions either about the resources or for Claudia and Max? OK, in that case, um, I think we'll conclude the webinar now and really just a big thank you to everybody who's contributed today. So thank you to Shauna and Louisa um, and particularly to Claudia and Max for their fantastic contributions. Thanks, Nicola. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you.